All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Suncoast Haven of Rest Rescue Mission. Thanks for having me tonight. My name is John. Grateful believer in Jesus Christ and just happy to be here with you guys and share a little bit from his word. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Ask God to prepare our hearts. Father God, thank you for loving us and saving us through your son, Jesus Christ, and doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. Thank you for assembling us here tonight. Um, nothing is random in your kingdom, so we're all here for a purpose. And uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit teach us tonight, Lord. Open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our souls to hear from you. And uh, help us to just put away the cares and the worries of the day and of the outside world there because uh, we can just focus on you and nothing else matters. You're worthy to be praised, worthy to be called our King and our, and our Lord and our Savior. And so uh, you be the teacher tonight, Lord. And open up your word and give every one of us a better sense of who you are and just a, a greater closeness to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to talk a little bit tonight about heaven. Not heaven in the sense of uh, where we're all going to go as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, although that is uh, always a worthy topic and it's kind of related. But what I really want to talk about tonight, I guess, is more the word uh, described as heaven tourism. All right. I want to start out by, I'm giving you a little tease with that, and then I'm going to start out by reading John 14.2. Jesus is describing a place that he's preparing for all of us. And he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place, you know the way to the place that I am going. Jesus himself tells us that he's preparing a place for each one of us in heaven. I want to talk a little bit tonight about this, this rising fascination that uh, is filling our society today and has been for probably the last 10 years or so um, in these accounts that people are coming back with about having visited heaven. All right. Um, I did quite a bit of research on this about four years ago and had written up some notes and things. And it started out because about four years ago, it became very popular. There was a book called Heaven is for Real that came out. So popular, it even, they even made it into a movie. And it was a story about um, a man named Todd Burpo. He's actually a pastor. And his son Colton, who um, was anesthetized while he was having an emergency appendectomy at the age of four. And uh, when he came out of his, uh, his anesthesia, he had... Uh, these wild accounts of having been to heaven and he says that he got a halo and he got real wings, although they were too small for his liking. He also claimed that he sat on Jesus' lap while the angels sang to him and that he saw Mary standing beside Jesus' throne, that he met the Holy Spirit and he actually described the Holy Spirit as kind of blue. Now, to just kind of briefly recap some of this, you know, more than 10 million copies of that book were sold by 2014. And then it was made into a movie that was produced by T.D. Jakes, a famous evangelical televangelist, you know, 10 million grossing movie. There's another second movie, a second book out called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, sold a million copies. This one was by Kevin Malarkey. And this is about his son, Alex, who at age six was nearly killed and left permanently paralyzed in a devastating automobile accident. And in the aftermath, during his rehabilitation, Alex says he made multiple trips to heaven and back. And in the Malarkey's version of heaven, the book is considerably darker and it's not as full of details as little Colton Burpo. Um, he says there's a hole in outer heaven and that hole goes from heaven to hell and the Evidently, this is a portal. The devil can go back and forth. and um, He's a major figure in Malarkey's description of paradise, interestingly enough. And little Alex says that he's personally seen Satan many times, first at the accident scene and then later in heaven. All this to say that, you know, what do we do with this? 
You know, some of these these accounts they seem almost, you, you know, I mean, <laughs> mind-boggling in some way. The, the, these crazy and wild details about this, but unfortunately, there are a lot of people within. Christendom within the evangelical community that are buying into this stuff. I mean, it's not lost people that are buying up these books. It's Christians. They're buying up these books and reading them and believing in, in this stuff, you know. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unashamedly um, declare before you guys that I don't believe any of it. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily say they're outright lying, but I just don't believe it. I mean, I want to be like the Bereans. If you remember the Bereans, you know, in Acts chapter 17 verse 11 Paul um, preaches to the Bereans and he says they received the message with great eagerness and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true and many of them believed and we're encouraged to be like the Bereans to examine everything in the light of scripture so if this is if these accounts of of heaven are true that these little kids are Having an adult help them write the book, you do understand that, that a six-year-old didn't sit down and write that book, but he somehow, you know, facilitated by adults. But anyway, I mean, and I had a whole list of, of books because of the time here. I'm not going to go into it, but there's at least 10 best-selling books about this. My Journey to Heaven, What I Saw and How It Changed My Life, and all these things. This is, go this is over the last 10 years, but even going back 25 years ago, there was a, there was a, a best-selling book called Embraced by the Light, number one bestseller in the New, New York Times. And it's all, you know, what do we make of it? Well, we're supposed to be salt and light to the world, so we should have some position on this. We should be able to, you know, look at this. And, and in light of what Martin Luther says, sola scriptura, the Bible, you know, only scripture, the Bible alone, we should be able to go to the Bible and find answers for this thing. Are these, are these stories true? Are we supposed to believe them? What's going on? Because I don't believe that any true evangelical should be in any way tempted to give any validity to any of these stories that, uh, in any of these books. And, and, and hopefully I'm going to be able to in some way state my case or plead my case here. All right. The Apostle John warns us in 1 John 4, 1, he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so we have to take that Berean mindset about anything that ever presents itself to us as, as, as truth, and certainly when it seems to conflict with what we do know about the Bible. 1 Peter 5, 8, we must be alert and sober-minded, testing and holding on to the good, because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to de devour. A Bible teacher whom I admire and, and follow and, and read a lot of his books, he says this, he says, let us minimize the thoughts of man and magnify the truth of God. And that's what we should always be doing. Minimize the thoughts of man, magnify the truth of God. Because unfortunately our level of discernment on the topic of heaven within the church is extremely low. Because if we had a higher understanding of what the Bible teaches about heaven, then we would understand that the whole premise behind all of these books is contrary to what the Word of God says about heaven. Some of you may have heard of John MacArthur. He says this. He says, For anyone who truly believes the biblical record, it is impossible to not conclude that these modern testimonies, with their relentless self-focus and the relatively scant attention they pay to the glory of God, are simply untrue. They are either figments of the human imagination, dreams, hallucinations, false memories, fantasies, and in the worst cases, deliberate lies, or else they are products of demonic deception. We know this with absolute certainty because Scripture definitely says that people do not go up to heaven and come back. Proverbs 30, verse 4 says, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? And the answer, we can find it in John 3.13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself. All the accounts in, of heaven in Scripture, first of all, are visions. They're not journeys taken by dead people. And even these visions, they are very, very rare in Scripture, and you can count them on one hand. So let's go to the Bible for a minute. Let's... let's be like the Bereans. 
Only four people who wrote books of the Bible had visions of heaven and, they, and wrote about what they saw. These are the prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel, and the apostles, Paul and John. Two other biblical figures, Micaiah and the apostle Stephen, got glimpses of heaven, but what they saw is merely mentioned and not really described. So let's take a look at this. First, the two glimpses of heaven. Micaiah, in 2 Chronicles 18.18, 18, continues and says, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing on his right and on his left. That's it. One glimpse. There it is. Then in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, the Apostle Stephen, when he's getting stoned to death, had to add that, but Stephen, <laughs> full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. These were prophetic glimpses, not near-death experiences. Now the Apostle Paul never describes heaven beyond the glory of God. And there's a good benchmark to use when people want to say that they've, they've been to heaven and come back. Are they, their descriptions, are they going to be glorifying God and is it all going to be about celebrating God and Jesus or is it about all this other funky trappings, you know, and descriptions of, of, of crazy stuff? Paul was caught up into heaven in an experience so vivid <clears throat> that he said he didn't know whether he went there bodily or not, but he saw things that are unlawful to utter, so he gave no details. This is the Apostle Paul, who wrote more than a third of the New Testament. He's not sharing with us anything about heaven, any wild stories. He covers the whole incident in just three verses, in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2, 3, and 4. I know a man, he's talking about himself in the third person, and he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. That's it. All three biblical writers who saw heaven and described their visions give comparably sparse details, but they agree perfectly. Isaiah in Isaiah 6, says, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. The two wings with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Again, it's about the glory of God, and there's a sense of reverence and awe about what they're, what they're seeing and experiencing. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1, verses 25 through 28, says, Above the vault of their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. And, Apostle, and, and John, in Revelation, says this, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and pearls of, peals of thunder. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And he goes on in Revelation 5, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive, the, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You see, the, you see the trend there? They're all about the magnificence and the glory of God. And they're all celebrating and worshiping God with this sense of reverence. And they're, they're, they're in agreement. They're not contradicting each other. 
They don't, however, agree at all with the accounts of a four-year-old or a six-year-old or some of these other people that uh, have written some of these books. Both the tone and the details that they highlight are, are completely different. The biblical authors are always fixated on God's glory, which defines heaven and illuminates everything there. Remember that also in that description in Revelation, when, when, the, new heaven, when the new Jerusalem is made, God is going to be among us, and his, we're not going to need the sun anymore because God is just going to light everything us. It's all about his illuminescence and his brilliance and his glory. And going back to John MacArthur, because he, sometimes he can just say it best, he says that the biblical authors are overwhelmed, chagrined, regretful, dumbfounded, petrified, and put to silence by the sheer majesty of God's holiness. What you don't see in the biblical accounts is, are any frivolous features and juvenile attractions that seem to dominate every account of heaven currently on the bestsellers market. Here's another thing to think about in the Bible as we're, we're still playing Bereans and looking to the scriptures and testing everything. Not one person raised from the dead in the Old or the New Testaments ever recorded for us what he or she experienced in heaven. Think about that. That includes Lazarus, who spent four days in the grave. Lazarus of Bethany fell ill and died, and his body lay decaying in a tomb for four days until Je Jesus raised him in John 11, verse 17. A whole chapter in John's Gospel is devoted to the story of how Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. But there's not a... And for four days he was dead. Little Colton Burpo was under anesthesia for a couple hours. This guy's been dead for four days. You'd think he'd have something to say when he came back, right? But there's not a hint or a whisper anywhere in Scripture about what happened to Lazarus' soul in that four-day interim. The same thing is true of every person in Scripture who was ever brought back from the dead, beginning with the widow's son whom Elijah raised in 1 Kings 17 and culminating with Eutychus, who was healed by Paul in Acts chapter 20. Not one biblical person ever gave any recorded account of his or her post-mortem experience in the realm of departed souls. That's thought-provoking there, isn't it? Now, I know you could argue and say, well, you know, maybe you know, it wasn't the right time and God was just keeping this back and now he's choosing to reveal it, you know. Okay, well, even if, uh, let's, let's again be the Bereans and say, well, then we should be able to still test these new accounts in light of Scripture and they should still line up. There shouldn't be any contradiction and there ultimately should be no doubt about whether, you know, the validity of them at all. And again, I just, it, it breaks my heart that so many in the evangelical movement have actually ab abandoned their evangelical convictions, you know, and, and, and are turning to these teachings that, like I said, I, I, I don't see any justification in Scripture for them at all. You know, an interesting side note, the, the woman, the, the ghost writer, if you will, her name, was Lynn, her name is Lynn Vincent. She co-wrote, or really she wrote the book Heaven is for Real on behalf of little four-year-old Colton, right? And she said that she was initially reluctant to include Colton's description of people in heaven having wings. And this is a quote from her, the woman who wrote the book. She says, if I put that, if I put that people in heaven have wings, Christians are going to think that the book is a hoax. Well, she did put it in the book, and a lot of us don't think it's a hoax. That's, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's thought-provoking at the very least. So we need to be elevating our discernment skills all the more as the time is growing near and the pressure is on and, and the, the world out there is getting more and more uncertain and more and more decaying, as it says in Romans, you know, that it's just un unwinding and unraveling, you know, and the world's going to look to us. The world is going to look to all of us. And we're, you know, we have a, a responsibility, but we have a mission that we're all called to, you know. Be prepared to give anyone an answer you know, who ask you for the reason, the hope that you have. First Peter 3.15. We want to be prepared. So this is all in light of iron sharpening iron. A couple more things of what the Bible actually says about heaven. <clears throat> you know, in the Bible, it actually talks about three different heavens. 
So something I learned in, in, in doing this research too. There's actually three different heavens. This is what they say. The first heaven is where the birds fly. I mean, the, the word heaven is used, and it's basically what we would call the atmosphere. You know, like in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, And God said, Let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So there's the heaven as we know it as the atmosphere. The second heaven that's described in the Bible is a place where the sun and the moon and the stars are, which we would probably call space. Deep, you know, near space, deep space, outer space, you know. Because again in Genesis 1 verse 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And then there's this third heaven, which is the dwelling place of God. And it's spoken of quite frequently. Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. 2 Corinthians 12, this is again quoting Paul when he talks about this. He says, I know a man in Christ, speaking of himself, who 14 years ago was caught up in this third heaven. So the third heaven is what we probably generally want to believe is heaven. It's where God is. And when we think about somebody dying and they're going to heaven, that's, that's where we think about it. And that's how the Bible uses that word. But understand that heaven is a real place, and although the new Jerusalem is now in God's dwelling place, he's going to move it back, or he's going to move it to this earth. Revelation 21 says, this is John speaking, and he says, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then after God destroys sin, the earth will be made new, and given to righteousness. The holy city will be the capital of the new earth, and God will give... And God will live with the righteous right here on earth. And where the Lord abides, that is heaven. It's somewhere way out there now, but it's going to be here right with us. And the interesting thing about God, even though he's in heaven, he's also indwelling us. His spirit's indwelling us. So we're not, even though I suppose in a three-dimensional sense, we've got to think of this thing as being very far away. You know, God is right here. The kingdom of God is at hand, as Jesus said, you know, in Mark chapter 1, when he, when he started his ministry, you know, the kingdom of, of God is, is at hand. It's, it, it can be within all of us, you know. So that's just a, a supernatural truth that uh, we can't really explain, but uh, th that I firmly believe. Revelation 21, verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then if you're, if you're interested, it, for the sake of time, I won't do that, but maybe a little homework for you guys, is go read Revelation 22, starting in verse 2, and the whole thing about the, the river of water and life and the streets of gold and all those sort of things, you know. Very interesting. There's a real, a real vivid description of that. So just some closing thoughts here about that. Um, like I said, I believe in going to the Bible, and I don't see any justification to believe any of the details of all these stories. I don't know why... You know, is the enemy using this? Uh, who knows? I, it may just be the Lord is allowing it to happen to test all of us to just make sure that we're really spending time in our Bibles and knowing what's going on and, you know, that we can defend, that we can be better and stronger defenders of the faith, you know. Because along with that, there's another question about, you know, can our deceased relatives see us from heaven and can we communicate with them? All right. And Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 says, the dead know nothing. And the, so the Bible teaches us you know, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. Um, I don't believe either that we can communicate with, with the dead at all, and I, and I certainly hope you don't either. There's a whole thing on necromancy and, and, and mystics and psychics and, and mediums, you know. Um, Isaiah 26, verse 14, the dead cannot communicate with the living. He says that consulting, the consulting of mediums, witches, astrologies, and psychics is sin. It says that in De De Deuteronomy 18. And that spiritists should be cut off from God forever, Leviticus 20, verse 6. And it all comes down to nothing anyway, Isaiah 19, 3. Don't be caught up in that kind of stuff. You know, we're flesh and blood right now. You know, three-part beings, body, soul, and spirit. We have a purpose here, and that's to, 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 to communicate the, the definitive, clear gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world before it's too late. And get as many people to be able to experience this this heaven that's going to come down and be brought right to us here at some point. And we want the party to be as big as possible. 
you know, and I'll just add that, you know, Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9, it talks about the great throne of heaven, there will be people from every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. Understand that there's no racism in heaven, you know, maybe it's relevant right now with what's going on out there. There's going to be people from every single color out there. White people might be the minority, you know, I don't know how that's going to work out. More than likely it will be. We'll actually be in a minority in there, you know. But understand, there's no racism in heaven. There's no racism in the kingdom of God. There never was. That's for another message, which I've given on that, on that as well. You know. But uh, let me just close with, this is the, this is the, the verse or the teaching that kind of, it, it was the, I call it the deal sealer for me. This is what confirmed it for me when, even after everything that I've said, you might be saying, well, that, that sounds great. I understand what you're saying, but there's the Bible. And then how do you just, you know, how do you reconcile all these, all these people with all these accounts, you know? I'm going to take you to Luke chapter 16. To Jesus' own words, he's talking about, he's given a story here, and he's talking about the rich man and Lazarus. And there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. This different Lazarus from the one in John 11 who, who, who was four days dead. But this beggar Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. And now listen to these next two verses. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And this is it, verse 26. Luke 16, verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And I love the King James Bible, which actually says, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. And that's how it was taught to me back in the day. And it's like, that is the money verse right there. That is the go-to verse. You want, people want to be talking to you, presenting to you their, their theories about going to heaven and coming back. Jesus Christ, out of his own words right there, he's saying, there is a great gulf fixed between there and here, and nobody gets to cross over at all. You know, Jesus Christ in Hebrews, he's the book of better things. He is the, the number one in everything. Well, he's the number one guy. He's the only one who's gone back and forth. And he's not about to share that with anybody and any of that glory. He's the only one that has, that came, he he's, was up there, came down, and he's gone back and he lives in our hearts. And that's it. There is nothing else. And I hope that I've, I've been persuasive of you on this. This is, this is the deal that sealed it for me. I heard a teaching on it probably 20, over 20 years ago, before this whole heaven tourism thing. And I just thought, yeah, that's right. I had never thought about that. But there is this great gulf fixed, this great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, and nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The end. So, um, I, I hope I've been somewhat persuasive in this. If you have any questions about this, I urge you. I'm going to stick around with my buddy Lionel here and have dinner, and uh, we will... Uh, break bread and fellowship and just uh, talk of things, things heavenly. Um, but then also understand that heaven right now is, what we like to say, is where God is, and that everybody can spend eternity with God if they would just receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know? It is the one great equalizer out of God's entire creation. Whatever race, creed, color, belief you are, you know, there is only one way, Jesus said, one way to enter the kingdom of heaven, and that is to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And if you haven't done that, if you've never done that, it comes down to you just admitting to God that you're not perfect, that none of us are perfect. You know, we, we mess up. We still do. Even as born-again believers, we still mess up. We make mistakes, you know. And we'll never be able to be perfect enough to live with a holy God without his, him making some accommodation to us. And that's what he did. He made this amazing accommodation when he first created the world and then 2,000 years ago sent his son.
Jesus Christ. And he paid the price for all of our imperfections. And all we have to do is just accept that, is just receive that, to just really understand that, understand that I'm, that, that I'm you know, I have a sinful nature about me that I can never overcome on my own, but that Jesus Christ overcame it for me. And I just acknowledge that and thank him for it. And that's it. And that's how I believe. And that's how I become born again, is this trusting in the sacrifice that Christ did on the cross. So if that's you, friends, let, let me just close in prayer. I'll invite you to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. Father God, we thank you for your word, which we have any questions about anything, we can go to it. And it, if we will just be like the Bereans and study and test everything, that we can come up with the answers. Certainly enough direction and enough illumination for us to be able to proceed and to live and to understand what your plan is for, for what's going on and what's happening around the world with, with us right now, Lord. So thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for loving us before we ever loved you. And thank you for making it your heart's desire that nobody would be lost forever, that nobody would spend eternity separated from you. You've sent your son Jesus, and we have this account in the Bible, all down to many details, multiple eyewitnesses. Everything is confirmed in writing here. And we just have to believe. And it's so simple that maybe that's why it's so hard. Because we would, in our own minds, we think it's got to be something very complicated and, and, and worthy and testing or whatever. It, it's very simple. We just have to trust in your love for us and that your son did it all for us. And just say yes to your son. So, if, friends, if you're there right now, right here in this room, maybe one of you or more has never trust, completely come to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or if you're on the Internet watching right now, then, friends, I just urge you right now, just, just come to God right now and surrender yourself to Him. Just say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I am not perfect and, and do wrong things. But I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe that He came down to earth and died on the cross and paid for my sins. And that because of that payment, Lord, you will see me as perfect. When I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You see me as perfect from this point on. So Jesus, I confess you right here and right now in my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Live in me and show me how to live from this point on. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Give God a hand. Give God a hand. So. I always got to ask because we are an evangelical mission here. Did anybody, anybody receive in Jesus Christ here for the first time? Most of you guys already. If, if you have any questions about that salvation, Jesus, or about we talked about heaven, please hit, hit, hit me up. Let's have dinner together. You know, let's talk about it. And for you that are on the internet, that uh, if you did receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, we love to hear about that. So please pick up the phone and give us a call. Um, we can send you a Bible. You can come down here and pick up a Bible. Um, we'd love to have you just come down here and see what we're all about. So um, this is a, your spiritual birthday is today, right now. So you'll never be the same from this point on. Let us know. We'd love to hear about it. So thank you guys for listening, and I will then say a prayer for the food. Father God, thank you for this food which we're about to eat. We ask that you bless it to our bodies and our bodies to your glory. And Lord, uh, thank you for the hardworking staff and volunteers that are, that are making this meal possible, that are keeping this mission running during some absolutely trying times here, Lord. And they're, they're champions and heroes, un unsung heroes of the faith just continuing to allow your work to go forward, the gospel to be preached here in Pinellas County, and, and people to get saved, people whose eternity is going to look a lot different because of their efforts here on your behalf in the mission. So thank you for every single one of them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.